Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. I'm Stacy Herbert. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, ideas are the currency of any revolution, Stacy Herbert. Max, ideas are in our headlines today. The first one, could the Cindy Sherman of monkeys accidentally revolutionize copyright law for artists? So Cindy Sherman is the famous artist who takes self-portraits. And if you look at this image, that's not Cindy Sherman. That is a monkey from Indonesia. And he took the camera from a nature photographer visiting Indonesia and took self-portraits of himself. Now, this has become a big copyright issue because copyright in photography always belongs to whoever took the photo, who actually snapped the button, not to the person who owns the camera or whatever. So the, the man who took this photo, David Slater, was working for Cater's News Agency. And now Cater's News Agency is sending out cease and desist orders to people like TechDirt.com who posted the photo. And TechDirt is saying, well, you don't own the copyright. And uh, the agency wrote back to them and said, well, neither do you, so you can't post it. Well, copyright law, even in its current absurd iteration, and we've talked about it before, it's uh, effectively a global lobotomy, this perpetual copyright, as Lawrence Lessig calls it, doesn't extend to the animal kingdom. Now, the monkey took a photo of himself, and if anyone owns the copyright, it would be the monkey. I am for this monkey <laughs> using his psychic abilities to contact an attorney immediately and to sue caters. Perhaps Monkey wants people to know about his ideas and his uh, plight in Indonesia as the rainforests are being chopped down. Well, that's right. The, the wilds of the ideas are what engender creativity and have driven human creativity and evolution for millennia. And the fact that copyright law and intellectual property laws are chopping down the, in, the landscape for ideas, just like they're clear-cutting forests where this monkey, poor monkey, is living. They're clear-cutting ideas using copyright law from ugly monopolists and moguls like the, the former head of News Corp, Rupert Murdoch. Now, this agency, Caters News Agency, isn't claiming to own the copyright. The idea has infected their mind that we can shut down ideas and we can keep people from communicating ideas. They're trying to keep tech dirt from communicating ideas. But let's look at where so far a, an idea has not been copyrighted and it's allowed to spread. And that's from Tahrir Square. Hashtag Occupy Wall Street, a shift in revolutionary tactic. So this is from Adbusters and on September 17th, 2011, they're encouraging at least 20,000 people to show up in Wall Street, occupy Wall Street, and don't leave, just like the, the people in Tahrir Square didn't leave until their demand that Mubarak step down was met. The Americans are saying, don't leave until Obama forms a presidential commission to investigate whether or not there's been financial fraud. Right. Well, we've been talking about the global insurrection against banker occupation for months and months on this show. And we've been trying to encourage as much of this pushback against banker occupation, whether it's in Cairo or Tunis or Madison, Wisconsin. Now it's coming to New York, and they're starting to embrace this idea of a tent city in the public to push back against banksters. But as you're pointing out there, their demands are quite vague and obtuse, aren't they? Exactly. But they're also focusing just on the tactic. Uh, Tahrir Square was not about these people meeting and demanding that Mubarak leave. It was more than that. It was the idea that they no longer needed to live in fear of Mubarak's secret police, of which there were 500,000 torturers. It was the idea, the fear they got over. There's no sense here that this is an idea. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. marched with a million people on Washington, D.C. with a dream not with a demand that people, that Congress meet and determine whether or not there was racism in society. It was a bigger idea where they had overcome their acceptance that they were second-class citizens. Now, you don't see anything like this here. Well, first of all, they have to recognize that there's a war going on, that the war of banksters against the people. So they need to stop the war. They need a new stop the war campaign. 
And number two, they need to target the right institution. The institution to target in New York City would be the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And they should seek, and also they need an objective. The objective would be regime change. So occupy tent city in front of the New York Federal Reserve Bank until the current administration leaves. Uh, and, and you get somebody in there who's not, let's say, like a Geithner, Tim Geithner. Remember, Tim Geithner put, what was it, $8 billion of New York Fed cash, American dollars, onto a plane, airlifted it to Iraq, and it promptly disappeared. Oh, and by the way, Eric King of, uh, or Eric Prince of uh, Blackwater just happens to be now living the, the, the big life there in uh, the Middle East. I wonder where that money went. Well, you're more likely to get the same exact sort of paradigm that played out in Tahrir Square, which is, remember, what Mubarak said at first. First, he met the people in a televised address saying, well, I'll make a few little changes. That was basically, I'll have a commission to investigate whether or not there's been any fraud or corruption or torture. And then he said, there will be chaos if I step down. This is a classic technique that the New York Fed, the U.S. Fed, the bankster occupiers always claim. There will be chaos if we leave the scene. Yeah, they tried it. They did it in 2008, famously, with uh, Hank Paulson in front of Congress. And they've done it every few months since. The debt ceiling is another example. We're in the middle of one right now. Yeah, you know, there'll be chaos. There'll be chaos unless you give us more of your money and let us run roughshod over the political system and steal everything. There's going to be chaos. Well, let's look at how an idea can actually genuinely create revolution where you can change the system and not return to business as usual. $500 silver if you want it. Now, many look at that and they think, Oh, it's about the price. It's about making money off of silver, making fiat currency dollars issued by the New York Fed. And it's more than that. It's a revolutionary idea because many people instinctively also say, why would Max want $500 silver? Does he know what the world would look like in $500 silver world? Yeah, there's a number of really good points there. In other words, first of all, the $500 silver can be obtained if people want it because the silver market is so tiny that if millions of people around the world that are getting victimized by bankster corruption, they simply bought one or two ounces of silver, there's very little of it around. The price would go to $500. Your silver would be worth a lot more. But more importantly, the banksters would be put out of business. That's the point number one. Point number two, what would a world at $500 silver mean? It would mean that the peasants in America and around the world who are being disenfranchised and haven't seen wage growth in decades and are being treated like <laughs> by Obama would suddenly have a lot of money in which to restart the country and seek regime change and start a new republic. You know, the, in France, they're on their fifth republic. America, they need to get on to their second republic. They need to rewrite the Constitution, iron out some of the flaws and loopholes, return to some of the ideas that were there originally, go back to gold and silver, as it says in the Constitution. Yeah, but the other important ingredient to this, the other important idea to this $500 silver is crash J.P. Morgan, buy silver. Buy silver, crash J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is the single most powerful element of the U.S. Federal Reserve System. It is the New York Fed. And Jim Rogers has pointed this out several times indirectly over the last few weeks. He is asked over and over, are you shorting French banks? Are you shorting German banks? Are you shorting banks? He says, no, there is one bank alone, one major bank I am shorting, while buying silver, by the way. I am shorting one bank. And the reason he's shorting that bank is it alone, of all of the major banks in the world, is still at its all-time high. That tells you where the power is, who's still standing. All right, J.P. Morgan, they just reported their quarterly numbers. They came in with earnings. I think they were at or a little above expectation. I think they were way above expectation. Because all of their liabilities sit on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington. J.P. Morgan doesn't have any of its own liabilities. It runs up liabilities, and then it gives them to the people of America, the citizens, to deal with. They keep the profits. The Fed owns the liabilities. Oh, does this sound like Enron with their special purpose entity accounts, 700 of them? They just park their liabilities off the radar of any regulators, and they claim, oh, our earnings are going up every quarter? Yes, it is. Is J.P. Morgan the new Enron? Yes, it is. Will it lose $156 billion in capitalization? Yes, it will. Is that a good thing? Of course it is. You don't want financial terrorists in the system. Terrorism is bad. 
So again, this idea of Tahrir Square, how the Arab Spring has spread around the world. And in each place it spreads, and this is the thing about free culture and free copyright, is ideas are allowed to germinate and take their own form wherever it goes. Tel Aviv tent city erected in protest against high house prices. So Israelis are taking to the streets. They're setting up tent cities, and they don't want to back down until high house prices decrease. Now, of course, Netanyahu came out with the old paradigm, and essentially is, it's all about war and land grabs because he's saying uh, he'll solve the problem. It's not about inflation. It's not about money printing, why house prices are so high around the world. It's about the fact that there are too many regulations against building houses, which is not something you really think of when you think of uh, Israel. You know, my reading of the Old Testament is that you become what you fear. So here you have Netanyahu, who's running a ghetto in Palestine, while simultaneously opening the doors for ghettos to appear inside Tel Aviv and inside Israel. It's the supreme form of hubris. Well, aside from religion, this is a, the very basic fact is it's an idea that you do not need to be fearful. You do not need to fear your government. You are your government. We are the people. And these people in Israel, but despite all that religious voodoo that goes on and the, and the, the you know, religious hatred that the warmongers try to spread, these people are saying they are inspired by what happened in Tahrir, that you can, we can take back control. Ideas are the ultimate weapon of choice for revolutionaries. And I guess what you're saying here, and the, the takeaway from this, Stacey Herbert, is A, $500 silver if you want it, B, whether it's Mubarak or Murdoch, if you take away the facade of their power, which is based on fear, then the people win and the dictator goes away. Exactly, Max. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Stacey Herbert, for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, and thank you. Don't go away. Much more coming your way, so sit right there. Two thousand Americans die each year from car accidents. Only a thousand die in plane crashes. Seventeen thousand people will be murdered, and thirty-two thousand will kill themselves. Cancer in all its forms kills five hundred sixty thousand of us a year. Heart disease is even more devastating. It kills over eight hundred seventy thousand Americans every year. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to London and speak with Sandeep Jaitley, an expert on the Austrian School of Economics and a fund manager at First International Group. Sandeep, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. All right, Sandeep Jaitley, when we had you on the show a few months ago, uh, you described the Austrian School of Economics as being based on Karl Menger's idea that, quote, value does not exist outside of human consciousness. So elaborate yes. on this a little bit with some examples that we see around us today. A lot of people think that this means that somehow Austrian economics isn't grounded in, um, in, grounded in reality, you know, that if you say a statement like value doesn't exist outside of your own consciousness, it implies that you're sort of making up everything in your mind. 
Well, this isn't, this isn't what Karl Menger actually meant. What he meant was that sort of the object's utility is up to you and it's subjective, you know. Um, that's all he meant by, by that statement. Um, every human being is put on planet Earth and their restrictions are their surroundings, you know. Um, so, obviously, it was meant in that context. Okay, now... When Menger was putting forth his ideas, um, he was breaking from a dominant school at the time. I guess you could call it the neoclassical school. So how does it, yeah. how did he break from the school? So what were the main tenets that said this is in fact a new school, and how does it how does it achieve that break? You must remember that they they weren't neoclassical at the time. I think they were sort of the forefront of economics at the time, but. Um, Classical, neoclassical uh, models just assume that there is something uh, inherent about the object itself, rather than uh, the uh, rather than the sort of the qualities being ascribed to it by by the human in question or the collection of humans in question. Now, um, you e you either get that as a principle, sort of, or you don't. You know. Let me cut in here for a second. So, in other words. The organizing principle around which economics is based, you can take two approaches. One is to believe that objects have inherent value and that you're going to construct mm. an economy around that inherent value. Or B, you're going mm. to construct a school of economics that says that all value is subjective and that you're going to mm. organize your principles around the rather subjective qualities of the perception of these objects. And uh, so, therefore, of course, economics is known for having hard rules and based somewhat in mathematics, as you were just referring to. So the rules of the subjectivity, can, can subjectivity be, can it be codified? Now, I know at around Karl Menger's day, you also had the emergence of Freud, who tried to codify the unconscious and the subconscious, are these two things related in any way, uh, first of all? Yeah, well, you, you can codify it, Max. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to deny that maths is uh, very useful in economics, you know, but the way that maths is used in neoclassical economics, it would be like using, you know, Vedic Sanskrit to, to translate train timetables, you know. I mean, people are more impressed with the maths in neoclassical economics and the actual underlying thing of what it's saying. You can codify subjective economics, but you have to realize the limitations of, 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 of the maths that you can use. You know, so for example, very simply, you can't use um, continuous methods in mathematics. You know, the, uh, the thought process in economics is, 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 is discrete. You know, there is only an ordinal nature to the way you can describe things. You know, there is one use for, for water and then there is another use. There isn't one and a half uses in between. So that automatically restricts the kind of maths that you can use, um, but um, it's still maths that can be used nevertheless. So, so in Menger's economics, you, could, you, you would be using things more like discrete mathematics, topology, set theory, um, that kind of thing, rather than sort of statistical mathematics, which assumed that um, sort of interaction is in a certain linear way, you know, which it isn't. Let me ask you about the year 1971. Uh, in that year, mm. of course, Nixon closed the gold window and the world embarked on an experiment of getting completely away from any relation to a gold standard and one embarked on a path mm. of fiat money currencies that were all trading against each other in a way that you could describe as purely subjective. Here we are 40 years later and that experiment has clearly failed, and people are once again talking about going back to the gold standard, presumably because with gold, there is some relation to an agreed upon intrinsic value. How did we get all the way back to uh, out of the subjective world of fiat currencies? I th would have thought that could have worked if everything is subjective. Why has it failed? Why are we back to gold? Is gold a proper, I believe, under the Austrian school, gold is favored as a measure of, of a currency, yes? Yes, that's true. No, it's very true. You know, I mean, what um, is important sort of with the, uh, the gold standard is that, um, you know, gold as well doesn't have any intrinsic value per se. Um, 
So what you have to do is you have to look at how have people organized this, this substance throughout the millennia, you know, uh, that they've known this substance. And they've accumulated so much gold relative to how much is produced annually, the people still want it for some reason. Now, normally, if you produce a substance, you don't keep on producing it well in excess of the sort of the use that it can command. You know, you don't go around building up huge stockpiles of copper. You know, copper is only produced on, a, on an as-needed basis. But gold is different for some reason. Observing it from outer space, human beings like gold. You know, they've accumulated so much of it that, you know, there's a hundred years plus worth of production just sitting around already, yet still they want more of it. You know, so it's like it's almost been debased in the mind, the human mind, psychologically. You know, there is so much of it. You know, yet still they want it. You know, I'm not there to question why that is. That's something that um, you know, that humanity has decided, and obviously I'm a part of humanity as well. And I'm not going to go against it. You know, so that's the only way you can look at it. All right. So Sandeep, um, this of course is on everyone's mind because recently in Congress, Ron Paul uh, asked Ben Bernanke if he believed gold is money. Bernanke responded, "No, gold is not money." So this opens up, obviously, a lot of different points. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts at, that, at this point? Dr. Bernanke is, is just plain wrong. You know, the people decided that gold and silver were money many, many thousands of years ago, and no government diktat can usurp that, uh, that viewpoint. Okay, you let know. me cut in for a second, um, because, in other words, you're saying that the collective consciousness or the collective unconsciousness can dictate the perception to the degree of validating what the subjective reality to be becoming the objective reality. And Ben Bernanke has created a charade for many decades convincing people that fiat money is real and that fiat money needs trust. And he's unable or unable to understand that if the market, that is to say the people, decide that now gold is money and fiat paper is worthless, that that's going to be the new reality. So is he, how is he constricted? Is he constricted philosophically? Is he constricted intellectually? Is he constricted politically? What is Ben Bernanke's problem? <laughs> I imagine that there's a large element of, of sort of um, politics involved in this, Max. You know, I mean, um, if you look at the way, for example, the Bank of England was founded, you know, um, they, they had to come up with an arrangement to lend uh, money to the government in order to do their bread and butter business of discounting bills of exchange, you know. Um, so the notes that the Bank of England created were sort of part capitalised by good bills of trade and they were part capitalised by um, government debt. Now... Um, sort of fast forward 300 years, you can't go around and say that um, only um, gold is money or, 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 or something else, um, uh, something else apart from what you're using for money is money, you know, because you're sort of going against that principle, which is a wrong principle, you know, no one should establish their business to get into cahoots with government in order to do something else. But you have to look at it from that perspective. <laughs> OK, what about Greece, Portugal and Ireland? What should they do in response to these crises? Well, um, sort of, I think that everybody is starting to realise that there might be a problem in the Eurozone. Um, and this is true. Um, but there is no sort of recognition about what the, um, what, the, what the solution or the form of the solution shall be. So you have to look back in history and see what kind of monetary shenanigans have gone on in Europe sort of over the centuries. And effectively, it comes down to disenfranchising the creditor, you know. So every form of monetary debasement, whether you sort of reduce the amount of precious metal in the coin or you increase the amount of units that a piece of metal will get you, it's a form of disenfranchisement of the creditor. So I imagine something along similar lines will be pursued in Europe. You know, you, you haven't had a monetization scheme in a similar vein to the British and the, uh, the Americans. Um, so what's likely to happen is you're probably going to have a secondary um, Eurozone fund created 
which will have €3 trillion Euros worth of unfunded capacity to start buying up uh, debt on the open market, um, you'll probably extinguish all of these issues to do with liquidity and solvency at the same time. Then, um, you know, you will achieve two things. You'll, you, you'll reduce the purchasing power of the euro dramatically, which I think a lot of, a lot of countries in the eurozone want. Um, and you will um, eliminate all forms of question marks of solvency around rolling, sort of when it comes time to roll old bonds into new bonds, you know. And you can come up with some kind of levy for this fund for all countries that sort of have their bonds purchased by it. A okay, levy so that let, is me, let me cut in there. So in other words, Europe, uh, by bringing in, let's say, a euro bond, which covers all European countries, we don't really have that now, uh, it gives the European Central Bank the ability to monetize, as you say, or quantitative easing, as we know that for term in the, uh, the UK or the US, and to uh, mm. destroy purchasing power by creating more fiat money. Mm. And I guess this is what gold and yes. silver is telling us, is that nobody in any, yeah. any of these countries is willing to impose any kind of strict regulations that would keep mm. corrupt terrorist bankers at bay. They simply want to throw them the keys to the castle and let them print as much money as they possibly can. Finally, on the U.S. dollar, it's funny because it seems that you've got a very interesting arbitrage here because the 95 percent of the world's population that are not American seem to understand that the dollar is on its last legs and about to collapse. But yeah. that bubble yeah. inside America, that 5% of the world's population, seems like completely impervious to this news. Yes, they are. And, you know, the financial media generally is quite America-centric. You know, if you think the dollar is going to be bad, you ain't seen nothing till you see what the euro is going to do. You know, and <laughs> that's where I sort of, that's my, my, my view on the euro. And it's going to take a lot to change it against the dollar, I think. <laughs> that's where we have a slight difference of opinion, because, of course, within Europe, there's, <laughs> there's something called Germany, which you, you don't have anything like that in the, in the dollar. All right. Well, Sandeep Jaitley, thanks so much for being again on the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. And I want to thank my guest, Sandeep Jaitley. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.